Identifying metamorphic rocks. First of all, what is a metamorphic rock? Basically, metamorphic rocks are tortured rocks. They've been exposed to great heat, but not enough heat to completely melt them, otherwise they'd become igneous rocks. They've been subjected to great pressure, not just the pressure that squeezes sediment into sedimentary rock, but the kind of pressure that forces crystals to grow together or to collapse completely and be arranged into new mineral crystals that can withstand great pressure. They may also be subjected to chemically active fluids that introduce new ions into the newly forming mineral crystals. Basically, they're rocks that have morphed or changed because their crystals changed in response to the above forces. So, how do we classify these minerals? We start by asking whether they're foliated or not. Foliation is the irregular layering resulting from the alignment of different minerals. Although foliation results in layers, these layers are nothing like the regular bedding planes of sedimentary rocks. Let's take this piece of diorite. The crystals in diorite do not have any particular orientation. However, if we compress the diorite, the crystals start lining up at right angles to the direction that the pressure is coming from. You can even tell the angle of the directed pressure by looking at the crystals. Let's start with shale, the most common of all sedimentary rocks. It's composed of little flat crystals of clay. Now clay can't take a lot of pressure. It breaks down and becomes a totally different mineral. With pressure, clay becomes mica. Once the mica is formed, it's no longer shale, it's a low-grade metamorphic rock called slate. The flat little mica crystals may be too small to see, but their presence and the fact that they're all oriented in the same direction causes slate to split easily. We call this kind of foliation slaty cleavage. Well, what happens if we add more heat and pressure? Well, the mica will get bigger and you get phyllite. More pressure, larger micrograins, still not big enough to see individually, but they give the rock a kind of silky sheen. And also, the rock doesn't look as smooth, nor does it break as smoothly. With even more, you get mica schist. In this case, we have a muscovite mica schist. Now, every schist, regardless of the minerals present, has visible, flaky, or platy crystals. In mica schist, the flakes look like litter. Depending upon the composition of the parent rock, there could be other schists. On the left, you see a talc schist with these little pyrite crystals, right here and here. Those are called porphyroblasts. On the right, you have a muscovite mica schist with these garnet porphyroblasts. It takes more pressure to create a schist, so these would be considered medium-grade metamorphic rocks. More heat and pressure, a medium-grade metamorphic rock can become a nice, a high-grade metamorphic rock. Now the mica could no longer stand up to the pressure, so it morphed into feldspar and hornblende, among other possible minerals. The dark and light minerals segregate into alternating layers, giving nice a distinctive layering called nisic layering. Nisus can also be formed from diorite, as it, in the example given earlier. This nice here is probably formed from diorite, while this one could easily be formed from granite. So here's the sequence that we went through. You start with the shale, and you go to slate, phyllite, mica schist, and gneiss. In the process, the clay in the shale became very fine mica, and then larger mica, visible mica in the schist, and then finally in the gneiss, you get alternating layers of light and dark minerals. You started with a sedimentary rock, you went to a low-grade metamorphic rock, until finally you get to a high-grade metamorphic rock. If heating continues, some of the minerals start to melt. And if they all melt, the resulting rock after cooling will be an igneous rock. But if only some of the minerals melt, the resulting rock is in sort of a twilight zone between metamorphic and igneous. We call that rock a migmatite. Now the previous rocks all resulted from regional metamorphism. 
that is, heat and directed pressure associated with convergent boundaries. Rock in contact with magma and heated only has no pressure applied. We call that contact metamorphism. And that does not cause foliated rocks to form. Also, there are a few minerals that simply won't foliate. Calcite and quartz are among them. Let's take a look at quartz. If you have quartz sandstone, it be can become a metamorphic rock called quartzite. The grains of sand are now interlocking with no pore space. And as you would expect, it has a hardness of 7, just like the quartz. It has no cleavage planes. This is one tough little rock. It doesn't react to acid. You often find pebbles made of quartzite. Compare that to marble. Marble is the result of heating limestone. You get large interlocking calcite crystals. Calcite, of course, has a hardness of 3, so it's very easy to carve and polish. It reacts to acid, so you do not want your kitchen counters made of it. It's glittery. The reason is that the crystals are so large you can actually see the cleavage planes. Never use color for identification, for if a rock can be white, it can be almost any other color depending upon small amounts of impurities. Next we have hornfells. Hornfells could have just about anything as a parent rock. It could have shale, it could have basalt. Many possible rocks, if only heated, will become this very fine-grained, dark rock. I don't have much more to say about it. It is kind of a boring black rock. A conglomerate made of pebbles in a matrix of sand will become fused together as a metaconglomerate. There'll be no pore space between the once sand grains, and as a result, if you break a conglomerate, it breaks around the pebbles, but if you break a metaconglomerate, it breaks right across the pebbles, since the pebbles are probably the same hardness as the now fused matrix. If you add directed pressure to a conglomerate, you can get a stretch pebble conglomerate. Here's one more unfoliated metamorphic rock, anthracite coal. Now I know it kind of looks like obsidian with its conchoidal fracture but it's softer and lighter, and it's made of carbon. Anthracite is the last in a sequence of events that started with plant material. The compressed plant material is peat, and doesn't even deserve to be called rock. With more heat and pressure, you get lignite, a soft brown rock. More pressure still, you get bituminous coal, and finally, the most heat and or pressure, you get anthracite coal. It's made almost entirely of carbon, therefore burns nice and cleanly and very hot. Remember that chemically active fluids can result in metamorphism. Let's take a look at two rocks altered by fluids at plate boundaries, but low temperatures. One of them is the State Rock of California. It's called serpentinite, it's slippery green, and it's called serpentinite because it feels like the skin of a snake. It forms at plate boundaries and is the result of peridotite, which is the ultramafic rock of the Earth's mantle, joining with water. There's a complex set of minerals that form, so to be simple, we just call them the serpentine minerals. Soapstone is also the result of chemical interactions with an ultramafic rock at a plate boundary. Specifically, the ultramafic rock, probably peridotite, has reacted with water and CO2. The principal mineral is talc, which is why it feels soapy, and why it's very soft. Scratch it and you'll get talcum powder, as you can see here. Here you see my attempt to put all of these rocks into some kind of order. The yellow, are the foliated sequence of rocks. Now this is not the only sequence I could have given you. I could have started with a more mafic rock like basalt and ended up with amphibolites and green schists and such, but this is a very common one and it's worth knowing. Here we have the non-foliated rocks and finally here we have the rocks that are formed at plate boundaries 
by combining with water. I hope that you get the opportunity to see samples of these rocks and use this chart to make some sense of those samples so that the next time someone points out to a rock and says, what's this? You can say, why? That's nice. And so it is.